Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, May 11th, and this is the weekly market update. Uh, a little bit late today. Today's my birthday. I was actually traveling. Uh, I mean, birthdays when you're 57 aren't, to me, they're not the same, but, you know, like when you're a kid, you're all excited. You start to get to the near the end, rather the beginning, and it it's more ominous, but uh, no, we made another year, and uh, so that's why it's a little bit late. Had a bunch of stuff going on today, but uh, got to make sure we get these up one way or another. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you personal financial advice. Please consider this for informational purposes only. Do your own due, due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Again, as I said, I was a bit busy today, so it's a little bit shorter and probably not that exciting. Uh, I'm not saying I threw it together, but it is just, it's not the best effort. Okay, uh, here's Game of Trade, somebody that you should follow on X. Wanted to point this out. This is the yield curve. This is your 10-year uh, over your three-month U.S. Treasury bill. The thing I want to point out is, is that the yield curve has now been inverted for 500 days. That means that the short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. And uh, uh, that's happened before, as you can see many times. This goes back to 20. The thing I wanted to point out is it's happened three times, uh, in the, and the times so where that's happened is currently uh, 2008, which wasn't a good time, and 1929. So uh, that's pretty ominous. It's, you know, <clears throat> what I would say is that uh, obviously every economic era is different. And we can't just say that uh, this is going to be the same situation. But I don't know. It just feels like something's getting ready to happen, uh, something ominous in the economy. Uh, the, inf the, 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 the data that I'm looking at is just not good at all. So we'll keep going here. So here's more bad news. This is off Zero Hedge. I don't normally take stuff off Zero Hedge because most people already have seen it, but I thought this was worth repeating. Average credit card debt in U.S. now soaring past $6,500. A just-released report from Scleraro indicates that U.S. national average for credit card debt has escalated to $6,555, with New Jersey residents leading the nation with an average debt of $8,155 per credit card. School, Scularo, a national firm matching college students with potential scholarships, surveyed more than 2,000 people across the United States during the final quarter of 2023. Bruce McClary, Senior Vice President of Membership and Media Relations for the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, told the Epic Times that amount of debt is not surprising as many people are forced to use their credit cards just to stay afloat. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a little bit of a cold still. Uh, things are so much more expensive than they were three years ago, he said. The runaway inflation is, a, well, I wouldn't say it's runaway, but it, there has been, relative to the recent past, significant inflation. Quote, the runaway inflation is affecting grocery prices, and we've seen a roller coaster ride for gasoline prices. Many people don't have the money in their budgets for these added expenses. And so they're using credit cards and making minimum payments each month. Yeah, that's it. That's what we've been saying. We have a bifurcated economy. I saw another chart, which I wasn't able to grab. It basically showed that the top, whatever, 10% account for 40% of consumer spending. The bottom 50%, I think, it was something like that, account for only 9% of consumer spending. So the people that don't have any savings that are living hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck, they're stretched, they're broke, they don't have any more money. And so in order to try to not even try to maintain their lifestyle just to live, they're having to use credit cards. This is not going to end well, is my prediction. So 
Uh, yeah, not good. And this doesn't help, right? This is a chart I got. Pandemic excess savings is gone. You see the 2020, 2024 at one point because of all of the, this is courtesy of the Daily Shot, by the way. I like to give credit to the people that I uh, bum this stuff off of uh, X. You see that, you know, when the government was pumping money and sending checks to everybody, at one point, it was at $2.1 trillion. Now you're at negative $72 billion. So it says, there's a note here. It says, excess savings calculated as the accumulated difference in actual deannualized personal savings and the trend implied by data for the 48 months leading up to the first month of 2020 recession as defined by the National Bureau of Labor, uh, Bureau of Economic Research. So you see the big infusion of cash, of the stimulus, of the COVID response, and then as it got spent down, it's gone now. And so that's why people are on the credit cards. Um, as I said before, the price rises are embedded in the economy now, and people just don't have the money to pay. I think I've heard, I was listening to Jim Paplava the other day, and he was talking about some of him and his friends went to like a Five Guys or something, and he got like uh, two burgers and fries, and it was like 50 bucks. I mean, I've even seen that, like even a, like a foot long at Subway is like 15 bucks. You know, and you know, just for like a BMT or something. I mean, I mean, double meat. I get double steak and double beans at Chipotle, and it's like twenty-two bucks. You know, so I don't know how a lot of people are surviving. You know, uh, chicken thighs and rice, I guess, uh, and cream of mushroom soup. Uh, and you throw that in a crock pot. I guess that's the only way you can live: macaroni and cheese. But yeah, it sucks, and that's not going to be conducive to. Um, you know, higher consumer spending, and eventually this is going to be a problem. You know, not only is the consumer overextended, the government is too. So speaking of that, treasury bond issuance poised to explode higher. Again, game of trades. Thank you. Uh, U.S. Treasury bond issue set to increase this year. So this goes back to 2000, and you see the private treasury uh, or the uh, just the data for the Treasury bond issuance for 2024, and you see it's going to be 1.9 trillion dollars. This is like not a record. This is just for the extent of this chart. The point I'm trying to make is you see the financial crisis here uh, around 2008, and how what I said before happens. You know, when you have a massive economic dislocation or like the GFC. The, there's automatic stabilizers, automatic spending that goes into effect for unemployment, food stamps, Medicaid, that kind of stuff. And that's why during a pretty deep recession, you'll see the deficits and the need for the Treasury to sell additional securities <coughs> to pay will go up. And then you see uh, as the, uh, but we're supposed to be in a good economy right now. So, you know, a lot of this is just the excess spending by the Biden administration for this. Uh, basically goss plan that they're running of spending all this money on the green new deal infrastructure i mean that's what it is and that's what's causing a lot of the inflation right the spending is outpacing the ability of the economy to absorb it uh yeah there's labor out you know, there may be labor out there there may you know but is it qualified to build a chip factory i can tell you right now that it's very difficult to find labor that knows how to actually build a solar farm it's basically like putting a walmart bicycle together it's not really like super skilled high pressure pipe welding like i'm used to in a real power plant so the skilled people there's people but you know do they have the skill sets and so the people that do have the skill sets are in massive demand and so they are they are making out that's what i've said before if you're in the right place and you have the right skill sets for jobs that are needed you know you can make bank right now but I'll, most people you know, they don't, they, they may not have that. And so, you know, this is a situation now where suppose, you know, the, this in wage inflation we're seeing, but I think, you know, that's what I think the, we missed, we, we swung and miss on the, I swung and miss on the, on, the, on the idea that raising rates by 500 basis points would, you know, slow the economy down. I didn't account for how much, 
money they would actually shove into the economy, which was, you know, several trillion dollars. So, uh, so we kind of are a little bit in unprecedented times, but I think that the lag effect, all this stuff is eventually catching up. The savings is run, the money's run out basically. So unless they're going to do another helicopter drop onto everybody's bank account, then and if they do, we're going to have a massive inflation will reignite. So, um, yeah, we wait patiently for the economy to be, or the situation to allow for the Fed to do what it wants to do, which is to cut rates. Uh, that's what they want to do. They don't. They don't have. They just need the air cover. So I don't think that we'll get to the. I've said this before that we'll get to the two percent, um, but uh, inflation target. Uh, it, it'll all of a sudden be decided that three, three and a half is good enough, and uh, then we're you know off to the races. But I don't know when that's going to happen. I have no idea. And so it's not just the U.S. This is a uh, primary government physical ba physical balances have not reverted to pre-COVID levels. So you basically have balances as a percentage of GDP for a lot of the countries around the world. You know, with the exception, like the gray is 2018, right? So you had like Germany and Italy and New Zealand and Sweden. They all had, uh, you know, their balance was positive. And then you see the blue is in 2023. So the pandemic is over. And yet most of the countries, well, all the countries on here are running, uh, are running deficits uh, as a percentage of their GDP. And you see the big the big offenders here, the U.S., which is running deficits that haven't 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 been seen here as a percentage of GDP since World War II, and China. Okay, but you know you have France, Germany. Uh, I thought this was interesting. So it's not just the U.S. Everybody's spending like crazy. Everybody's uh, out there, and, and and no one no one anywhere is talking about austerity. No one's talking about balancing the books. No one's talking about being responsible. There's just, you know, reasons why we have to spend this money. And that's why you're having to issue all this treasury debt. So one of the things that we've talked about before is this jobs, you know, and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and say that people at the Bureau of Labor Statistics deliberately put out bad data. I just think that their are methodologies for gathering the data. A lot of it's a survey. It's not really empirical, but this is the ISM manufacturing report on business employment. It's below 50, 48.6. Uh, that's for manufacturing. And then you have services, which is 45.9. So they're both below 50, which 50 is expansion. Anything below 50 is contraction. So actual employment, according to these ISM reports, which I think are a little bit more accurate, um, are showing that basically late last year i mean we we talked about manufacturing even last year you see going back even the 2022 it was in recession you had employment was uh contracting there and basically late in 2023 uh the service sector went that way and uh you know i'm not saying we're going to have a 2000 you know have this pandemic response but um something's not right so which one which one of these do you believe? Do you believe the government statistics, which every week just seem to say we have growth in employment, and then a month or two later they revise it down and nobody talks about that? The headline numbers just discussed on CNBC, and then they move on and no one talks about the revisions uh, from the BLS data. So uh, I think that the consumer spending is going to start slowing down. Uh, like I said, we've had multiple multiple. Uh, data points now the data from you know mcdonald's and some of these other people about people not even being able to afford like a fast food meal so we'll see copper output continues to struggle chile copper output edges down in march copper output in chile the world's largest producer edged down in march data from copper commission Showed on Friday as production slid at state-run miner Cadelco, but rose at other major mines in the country. Output at Cadelco, the top global supplier, slid 10.1% to total of 107,300 metric tons in March, while at the BHP-controlled Escondida mine, which holds the world's largest deposit, 
output rose 9.7% to reach 101,000 tons. I think I didn't put the other blurb in here. Basically, if you even include Glencore and Anglo Americans mines or joint mine that they have, uh, overall their production in Chile was down like 0.7%. That doesn't seem like a lot, but in the context of the fact that copper demands growing not shrinking so chile being the world's largest producer of the metal needs to be in growth but you know can it grow you know we go back to what robert freeland said they met they they talk about escondida here which holds the world's largest known copper deposit it's true and you have people like robert freeland saying you need to find like eight more escondidas and bring them online like soon and it's just not happening so curtailed supply, supply that's challenged to grow against demand that continues to grow means higher prices. And here, here we have it. Here's our friend Robert Friedland here. Indian copper demand doubled over the last two years. Here's his tweet. Indian copper consumption nearly doubled in the last two years. Despite the strong growth, India's installed copper base remains woefully meager. Copper is all about infrastructure build out and expanding rewiring the energy grid. I think he uh, he likes to make this statement. I like to use some of these uh, quips that some of these guys use. He says that the copper price is going to go so high, you're going to need a telescope to see it. So uh, I don't know how far that is. I've seen a, additional comments come out in the last couple of weeks from Goldman Sachs and these others at the, you know, the current price is around 460, 463, something like that. I think it was last I saw the incentive pricing that I saw come from Goldman Sachs or one of the other banks was somewhere around $5.50. So you need to stay there or exceed it and stay stay at a high level that, uh, that uh, uh, incentive price for some period of time. And so, uh, you know, that bodes well if you have an existing asset that has costs that are less. That's why I talked about that Amerigo resources. I gave that away that name away um, a couple months ago, it's done well. So, I mean, I'm not big into like going to look for the copper juniors, but, you know, I think you can't go wrong buying like something like Glencore, right? So here's uh, some pretty interesting contrarian news for gold stocks. It says here, this is from a guy named Brendan Balow. I didn't verify this, but... Uh, it says here, Stansberry, he's talking about Stansberry Research. I don't know if you know Porter Stansberry. He has a newsletter empire. You know, the guy basically started on his friend's kitchen table with a laptop in 1999. Now he has this huge uh, uh, thing called MarketWise. Now it used to be called Stan. He has various things under it, Stansberry Research, a bunch of other stuff. Um, it's kind of interesting, the proxy battle or how he... He was retired. He was going to, it's a, a long saga that's kind of off topic what I'm talking about here, but uh, he's kind of an interesting guy. At first, I thought he was kind of an idiot when I first started seeing him back in the day, but I actually have a lot of respect for him. He built this newsletter empire. You know, if I could even do like one one hundredth of what he did, I would be set. But uh, yeah, he did a pretty good job. But uh, long story short, uh, Stansberry is officially shutting down their gold stock analyst newsletter. They're shutting it down. In other words, there's zero in investor appetite for gold stocks. Meanwhile, gold prices continue to make new all-time highs. And here's a blurb from Stansberry Research, which I couldn't verify. But anyways, it says, uh, this is from Stansberry Research, supposedly. After an incredible run, we've made the difficult decision to shut down our gold stock analyst service. In January, we announced founding editor John Duty's retirement after 30 years of leading this beloved publication. Throughout that time, John built a strong following based on his proprietary system for evaluating gold miners. Nevertheless, without John at the helm and with editor Garrett Goggin moving on after 14 dutiful years of work with John, we've decided to publish the last issue of Gold Stock Analyst this month. So a couple things here. Um... I think that Stansbury Research is a little bit more savvy than that. It might just be because this John Duty is is 
um, retiring and they want to just take down that masthead that he was in charge of. Um, there may be, they may not be getting, I don't know their internal documents. They may not, this newsletter may, you know, not get, have a lot of turnover. They're not getting new subscribers. So it was time to shut it down. Anyways, the guy's going to retire. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they bring it back, bring something back because, you know, I do have a, I do have a view that gold stocks are going to, you know, do something similar to what uranium stocks did. Because uh, I, I do feel the gold price is going higher. Obviously, central banks are driving the gold price higher. Uh, central banks don't buy gold stocks. So eventually that will come, uh, that that rotation. And then it'll be interesting to see if, uh, if you know, if they think, if, if a newsletter publication, uh, uh, masthead like Stansberry Research thinks there's a demand or they see, you know, Again, when the ducks quack, feed them. You know, if there's a demand for a gold stock newsletter, they'll provide one. So uh, obviously, you know, they didn't go out and find another editor or another guy to write it. Um, if there was a lot of subscriptions coming in, I'm sure that's what they would have done. So I think this is an interesting uh, data point to look at. Uh, like I said, I don't really know what's going on inside Stansberry, but, uh, you know, if, like I said, if there was so many subscriptions coming in and, and they're not going to turn down free money, right? That's just not how the newsletter business works, believe me. And so, uh, you know, the, I don't know if there's zero investor appetite, but at the news for newsletters, there may be just because there's been no action. And so, unfortunately, in the newsletter business, that's what we find, as I've said before, not just in newsletters, but everything, you know, people have FOMO, people, buy things that are going up people get their juices flowing uh and their gambling instinct comes in and you know uh if something's not moving then interest will rapidly uh rapidly dissipate from that uh sector and that's kind of that's exactly what's happened with gold but i don't i don't think that's going to be forever as i've said before so so this was like big news this week. Um, I don't really follow Next Gen that much. I, I just never have. I don't know why. Uh, they do have what's considered to be one of the best assets in the world. It's eventually going to produce tens of millions of pounds of uranium a year. <clears throat> and I think some people were upset that this is what they were spending their time and effort on. Basically, I guess they went out and bought 2.7 million pounds of uranium. They issued a, a debenditure to pay for it, $250 million uh, amount of uh, unsecured convertible debentures. And people are like, why are you doing this? Why aren't you working on this mine? What are you doing? And I guess maybe what I had read was some of the folks that thought it was a good idea said, well, the uranium price is going to go up. Several other uranium companies availed themselves of buying spot uranium or buying uranium at lower prices and then uh, are either holding it or have already sold it and made a nice profit. So maybe that's what next gen's thinking. They know they're not going to be able to maybe get their mind going the next year or two, three years. So why not do this with the anticipation that the uranium price is going to go much higher and that you'll basically, you know, if the price of uranium doubles, then, you know, you, you've even done, uh, you've done very well for yourself and shareholders, but uh, this is kind of like financial engineering. I'm not sure if I really like that. I kind of want my management teams focusing on what they're good at, uh, not prognosticating possibly on the uranium price, but you know, like I said, I, I only own this via the uh, ETF. So I don't really know that much about it. Be interested to hear if anybody else knows what's going on or what your feelings are on this. If you're a shareholder uh, in the show, in the comment section of the, of the video would be great says next gen is pleased to announce that it has entered into a binding term sheet for the purchase of 2.7 million pounds of natural uranium concentrate for an aggregate purchase price of 250 million dollars based on the five-day average spot price in satisfaction of the purchase for the u308 the company has agreed to issue 250 million dollars aggregate principal amount of unsecured convertible debentures. The debentures will be convertible at the holder's option into approximately 23 million common shares of NextGen, equivalent to 4.3% of the companies issued in outstanding common shares. So 
we'll have to see uh, how this turns out. But again, I'd be interested if you're an actual next gen shareholder and you've looked at this, what you, what you think about it in the sh in the show uh, comments. So a little bit of a political rant here. I saw this tweet by Elon Musk. He's got 42.5 million views. Um, and I did not, I knew this, but I had really not really thought about it too much lately, but this kind of reawoke me. This is really, to me, the only issue I care about. This issue alone of this unrestricted immigration is so potentially, um, has the ability to change the country very quickly which it already has and will continue if it's not put under control, that I think that a lot of people are sharing the same sentiments. Interesting, you know, you see it across racial, ethnic, you know, uh, uh, spectrum of the of people that live in the United States. You know, they we have people coming in and they are getting better, treated better than the, you know, historical populations that, that are from here. And, you know, Again, I go back to the Charlie, I use the Charlie Mungerism here, show me the incentives and I will tell you the outcome. And so Elon Musk tweets, most Americans are still unaware that the sense that the census counts all people, including illegal immigrants for deciding how many house seats each state gets. Not only that guys, it also goes into the electoral votes. And so, uh, I'll finish the tweet. Let me, he said, goes on to say, this results in Dem states getting roughly 20 more House seats, which is another strong incentive for them not to deport illegals. Of course, people need to disabuse themselves that these politicians or these political parties are there for your benefit. They want to stay in power. And it's not white fright. It's not white power to say that I don't, we don't want unfettered illegal immigration into this country. At this point, I don't want any immigration into this country. We have too many problems. You want to raise, raise wages? Cut back on immigration. It'll, it'll tighten the labor pool. Yes. Business won't like it. The Chamber of Commerce and the donor class in D.C. that's eating filet mignon and drinking $500 bottles of wine won't like it. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Okay. The, the historic populations of this country, the African-Americans now that are bearing the burden now of having their uh, services cut in their areas, okay, who have religiously voted for Democratic Party and then to see them, you know, bring in all of these foreigners into their areas, settle them and take resources away from their community and give it to them. Yeah, people are aggravated. OK, people are aggravated. This is the issue of the next election, in my view. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, in the past it was uh, I remember people like myself that advocated to shut the immigrant. I mean, I'm talking about going back into the 80s, guys. OK, I've been uh, people like myself have been saying this. So I, I don't say anything because I don't, you know, uh, you know, all your you're labeled a uh, people. It's, it degenerates in the name calling. No one talks about. How does all of this unfettered illegal immigration of third world peasant classes into the U.S. benefit the average person already living here? And yet you can't have that discussion because if you're against this, John, then you're, you, you know, you must, you know, you're a racist. That's how that's that's how it works. Right. Basically, you know, this is what it's about. You know, great replacement. That's what it's about. OK, holding on to power. They don't have, you know, they don't have to get these people voted at, at first. They can just get, get enough congressional hold on to their power that way via the census and via the apportionment of House seats and electoral votes. Then eventually, it's always two steps forward, one step back, guys. Then, then you know, you'll see in some municipalities now you're seeing where illegal uh, immigrants are going to be allowed to vote. It's, it's always like that. It's always incremental. The, the, the revolution never stops. Progressivism, progressing to utopia never ends, okay? You know, and, and, and it reminds me of like in the outlaw Josie Wales when the red legs, the Kansas Union soldiers are getting ready to cross the river on that barge and they're at old granny's store and 
the one scout that was uh, the former uh, Josie Wales commander said, well, after we get Wales, that's it. And uh, then the Red Legs captain was like, no, there's plenty of rebels up in Missouri. We've got to go up to Missouri. And uh, he said, after, and then the other guy gets mad and says, well, after we get Wales, it ends. And he goes, doing right ain't got no end. That, I mean, that's how these progressives are. It never ends. Where are you trying to take us? Okay, it, to chaos is what it is. Progressivism is chaos. And it has nothing to do with making the average person's life better. It has to do with them being in power and them holding power. And that's both political parties at this point. The Democrats are just more, they're just better at it and not afraid to, to, to do it. So, of course, you know, the president, uh, he opposes this, of course. He says Democrats oppose it. Um, I will put a link to the actual letter from the White House. I couldn't fit it on the screen here, but this is just the tweet. It says, the Biden administration, quote, strongly opposes H.R. 7109, which would exclude illegals from congressional district apportionment and the Electoral College. Democrats want to dilute democracy by giving foreign invaders voting rights. Yeah. Because they want to hold power. I mean, if Elon, I mean, I believe Elon. I'm not going to do the math, but evidently he's a smart guy. He, he's figured it out. That's roughly around just doing it this way uh, gets the Democrats another 20, you know, House votes, and that's enough. With things being so tight, that's enough to be in power. I mean, I think the Republicans have a one vote majority right now. So, yeah, that's it's not hard to figure out. People respond. People do things for a reason. They respond to incentives. And so, you know, what other reason is there to let all these people in? It's certainly not to the benefit of the working classes, which I told you earlier in this program are struggling. You, you know, I know that the Democratic Party wants, you know, more support and the Republican Party that represents, you know, business, big business in the, in the you know, U.S. Chamber of Commerce wants cheap labor. Do you know, I mean, I I didn't, I, I didn't I lost the article, but you know, with this illegal immigration has actually kept wages down. There was an article, somebody had already done the research into that, that we would have had, you know, climbing wages uh if we didn't have uh all this illegal immigration to to oversupply the labor market. So look, uh it is what it is. Okay, we're not gonna solve it here. But I think that uh, when you got a guy like Elon Musk saying this in 42 million. Uh, views, you know, I think this is resonating. I didn't read the comments or anything. I don't know if people were on board or if they were calling them a racist. I don't know. But uh, I do think that this, to me, uh, this is really the main issue that everything, uh, most everything else stems from. This really has to be brought under control. And from that, uh, but but who's going to advocate for you? Who is going to, you know, who, you know, who are you going to put in there that's going to actually do something about this. I mean, everybody almost, and it's kind of my cynicism, I think, is, is you know, is on the take, right, one way or another. All right, guys, that's it for the John Paulamy birthday shortened uh, edition of the weekly uh, video. Appreciate the uh, support. Another year, we just keep going and uh, we'll see what happens next week. Talk to you later.